seven. We have a go for main engine start. Five, four, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. 82 seconds into the flight of Columbia on January 16th of 2003, a large chunk of thermal insulation foam fell from a bipod ramp part of the structure that attached the external tank to the shuttle. Video of the launch revealed this foam striking Columbia's left wing panel, creating a nearly 10 inch wide hole. On February 1st, 2003, the shuttle made its usual landing approach to the Kennedy Space Center after a 16-day mission. However, just before 9 a.m., strange readings came in at mission control. Temperature readings were completely lost from sensors located on the left wing. Shortly after, tire readings also from the left wing disappeared completely. At 8.59 a.m., a call came in from the shuttle where Rick Husband was only able to say Roger before connection was completely lost. At this time, Columbia was near Dallas traveling at 12,500 miles per hour, about 18 times the speed of sound and was at an elevation of about 200,000 feet above ground. Several attempts were made to re-communicate with crew members with no success. 12 minutes later, when Columbia was meant to be making its landing, Mission Control received a call stating that the shuttle was seen breaking up in the sky. In the following weeks, the crew's remains were found, and it is believed that the crew actually survived the initial breakup of the shuttle, but lost consciousness after about 40 seconds as the cabin lost pressure, instantly being killed as the shuttle disintegrated. This means that the crew was likely alive as they realized their fate. It was found that the hole in the left wing allowed atmospheric gases to bleed into the shuttle as it made its re-entry, which led to the loss of the sensors and eventually Columbia as a whole. Maybe most shocking though is that NASA knew a safe return of Columbia was unlikely. There was no way to make repairs while in orbit, and as such, NASA decided not to tell the crew on board that their ship was damaged and that they were likely going to die, stating that wouldn't it be better to have a happy successful flight and die unexpectedly than to know there was nothing to be done? The launch of AS-204 was scheduled for February 21st of 1967, which was to make the first time that a three-person crew would be launched into orbit. But the launch never happened. On January 27th of 1967, a routine test was done. After entering the cab, the cab was filled with 100% pure oxygen. Then, as the crew ran through their checklist, tragedy struck. At 6.30, a voltage spike was recorded from a faulty electrical switch. 10 seconds later, an inaudible shout was recorded followed up by a clear fire in the spacecraft screamed by Chaffee. The pure oxygen in the cab was immediately consumed by flames and literally turned the breathable air into fire. The last sound was heard 7 seconds later when an inaudible garbled voice yelled, Bad fire, get out. Marking the end of all transmissions was 631 when the final images of the pit being watched by the outside crew saw Ed White reaching for the hatch as flames engulfed the monitor from left to right. It took a full 5 minutes with the three astronauts trapped inside before the ground crew was finally able to open the hatches. All three men were found burned alive inside. Grissom was found on the floor. White was found laying sideways, falling out of his seat, and chillingly, Chaffee was found having died, strictly following commands to his last breath. Despite the fire, he remained in his position, working hard to maintain communication until White could open the hatch. The death of the crew marked the first NASA disaster in which multiple lives were lost. Mission AS-204 was later renamed Apollo 1 in honor of the crew. The public today got its first look at NASA's new space shuttle, a hybrid craft that's a cross between a rocket ship and an airplane. 
In 1976, NASA unveiled the first ever reusable spacecraft shuttle, the Enterprise, marking an incredible feat that took nearly a decade to complete. The Challenger was the second of this kind of shuttle and took on regular flights beginning in 1981. From this time to 1985, the Challenger completed nine successful flights. The flight scheduled for January 22nd of 1986 was supposed to mark the 10th, but due to technical issues as well as worse weather than expected, the launch experienced multiple pushbacks all the way to January 28th of 1986, where after a six day delay, the time had finally come. However, this Florida day was oddly colder than normal and engineers warned that the frigid weather could impact rubber O-rings that sealed the solid rocket boosters. Despite these warnings and not wanting yet another delay, at 11.39 a.m., the Challenger lifted from the Kennedy Space Center with seven crew members on board. Initially, the launch appeared completely successful for over a minute. However, no one could believe what happened next. At 73 seconds into the flight, hundreds of spectators watched in terror along with millions of viewers on live TV as the spacecraft burst into a giant fireball at 65,000 feet in the air, disintegrating into thousands of pieces before plunging into the Atlantic Ocean at over 200 miles per hour. All seven crew members were killed. It was found that, in fact, two O-rings that sealed sections of the rocket booster had failed due to cold temperatures causing hot gas to leak out of the booster instantaneously collapsing and igniting the external fuel tank. It was also revealed that despite warnings discovered both by NASA and Morton Theocall, the company that designed the boosters, all warnings were ignored. Ten years later, in 1986, debris from the spacecraft washed up on the shores of Florida. Vladimir Komarov and the well-known Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, were known as being extremely close friends. The two did practically everything together. In 1967, Komarov was assigned to an Earth orbiting mission for which the Soviets had planned to launch Soyuz 1 to complete a spectacular mission. This mission was meant to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Soviet Revolution. However, this also meant that the capsule was rushed into production and Komarov knew that the capsule was not safe to fly. Technicians inspecting the capsule found a shocking 203 structural and electrical problems that could cause serious problems in flight. While that should have been enough to postpone the flight, the problems were pushed aside as anyone suggesting it wasn't safe was fired, demoted, or harshly punished. Komarov knew he was almost certain to die but refused to decline the mission as he knew his friend, Yuri, was his only replacement. With the bond that the two had, Komarov refused to allow his friend to die, believing that the legendary first man in space needed to be protected. On launch day, Gagarin is reported to have showed up demanding to be put into a suit and appeared to have tried to fight his way into the capsule to save his friend. Shortly after though, the Soyuz 1 took off and Komarov was on board. As expected, countless components began to malfunction almost immediately, with the chance of a safe return to Earth quickly seeming unlikely. Through an emotional conversation, Komarov made communication with his wife from orbit about what she was to do and say to their children after his almost certain death. After his 13th orbit, the mission was abruptly aborted. As the capsule began its descent to Earth, the parachutes failed to deploy, causing Komarov and the Soyuz 1 to freefall from the sky, hitting the ground at nearly 100 miles per hour. This photo shows the horrific aftermath of what Soviets believed was Komarov's body fused together with his seat. Incredibly, American intelligence heard the feet of Komarov falling to Earth capturing his final moments as he cursed those who sent him into orbit in an inferior capsule.
In the early 1960s, in a space race with the Soviets, the United States was going through tests of spatial technologies at a relentless pace. One such program was Project RAM. Test pilots Malcolm Ross and Victor Prather, wearing prototype space full pressure suits, were to fly in the Stratolab 5 balloon to extremely high altitudes as to test these suits. Their ascent into the upper atmosphere on May 4th exposed the two to extreme temperatures reaching lows of minus 137 degrees Fahrenheit. They completed an incredible feat, reaching an elevation of over 113,000 feet. At this height, anyone not wearing these special suits would have lost consciousness within seconds. The flight in total lasted nearly 10 hours and was overall a very successful mission. During their descent, after reaching a safely breathable elevation, the two opened their face masks. At 4.02 p.m., the Stratolab 5 landed in the Gulf of Mexico, and while not being the ideal scenario as they were meant to land on a flight deck, it was one that had been extensively rehearsed. Should they land in the Gulf as they did, a boat was to be sent for their pickup. However, not according to plan, a nearby helicopter hovering over the two lowered a hook to pull them up. Ross says that he invited Prather to go first, however Prather insisted that Ross go first. As Ross proceeded, he stepped into the hook but slipped. Luckily, he was able to pull himself back without falling into the water. As the hook then lowered once again to pick up Prather, he was unable to secure himself properly and he slipped as well. Unlike Ross, Prather fell backwards into the water. Now this wasn't particularly dangerous as the suits they were wearing were watertight and so the crew in the helicopter didn't make any immediate attempts to rescue Prather. What was not known by them though was that the pair had both opened their face masks. This would prove to be tragic as the suit slowly flooded with water. Horrifically, there was nothing Prather could do as his suit filled up with water, getting heavier and heavier dragging him into the ocean. Fighting for his life, Prather eventually drowned.